Yeah, there we go. And let's see here. Share, share screen, start broadcast. Ba, 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 ba. All right, and then I wanted to go into here. Okay, so we left off at question number 50 last time. And I'm just going to take a look at my notes here. Let's see what I wrote down. It says here, given, given a reaction, write the correct net ionic equation. And then it says here, what is the net, correct net ionic equation for the reaction of lead nitrate? And this, this should say lead to nitrate, but anyhow, I'll say lead to nitrate. I'll fix it up there. So lead to nitrate and potassium sulfate. And all that this is asking you to do is to write a balanced equation and then determine which ions will cancel out. And I'll show you how to do that. So if we have lead to nitrate by now, you should be able to write out the, the formula. Sorry, I'm going to try to delete that. The formula of lead nitrate, which would be PB, PBNO3, because nitrate has a minus one charge. So we need two of those. And it's in an aqueous solution. And we're going to add that to potassium sulfate, which is K2SO4. Sulfate is another polyatomic ion you should know. It has a 2 minus charge. And then we're going to do a double replacement. So the lead is going to combine with the sulfate to give us PBSO4. Now, this is something that we would give you. Yeah, we would give you the information for this. Uh, uh, with regards to solubility, you do not have to have the solubility table memorized. So we would tell you that this is a solid, okay? And then we'll put in here plus plus uh, potassium nitrate, potassium nitrate, was, which is a very soluble compound. Now I need to balance the equation just by putting a two here. So the next thing that we're going to do in order to get to the net ionic equation, which is where we're headed, is we're going to write everything here out into its ions, or everything that can be written to its ions, we're going to write it in its ions. Okay, so anything that says AQ next to it can be written out into its ions. So let's write down, we're going to have the lead 2 plus ion, which is aqueous, plus we have two nitrate ions, which are aqueous. Forgive me for writing so small, but I'm kind of running out of the space here. Then we have two potassium ions, which are aqueous, and a sulfate ion, 2 minus, which is aqueous. Now, it's important that you know that anything that has a, an S by it will not break up into its ions. So we're just going to write PbSO4 solid. Again, a solid means that it's not breaking apart into its ions. And then, of course, we have the potassium nitrate. So we have two K plus ions or two potassium ions plus two nitrate ions. So what are the things you have to know in order to write an ionic equation? So this is, the, this is just the, the uh, reaction. This is called an ionic equation. So we're going to get to the net ionic equation. But what are the things you have to know? You have to be rock solid on your polyatomic ions. So you'd have to know the charge of a nitrate and a sulfate. Okay. And then you'd have to know that anything that says AQ by it, you're going to split that up into... It's ions. Now, if we look at the ions that are the same on both sides of this reaction arrow, those are called spectator ions, and we can cancel those out. So you see we have two potassium plus ions, so two K plus ions, and we have the two nitrate ions. So those, again, are spectator ions. They are not participating in the reaction. So if we write down the net ionic equation, which I will call the net, the NIE, so we'll call this the, the NIE, the net ionic equation. The net equation or ionic equation of what's happening is we're taking lead 2 plus ions, right? That was there. And then we're combining them with sulfate ions. And we're making lead sulfate. Okay. And so this would be the net ionic equation, this one right here. Here we go. So let's take a look at the next question, question 51. Question 51, which says, given a single displacement reaction, determine the substance that's being oxidized. So determine the substance that's being oxidized. So the good way to remember oxidation is oil rig. So oil stands for oxidation is losing electrons. And of course, 
RIG stands for reduction is gaining electrons, right? So follow, follow the electrons. Now, Dr. Garcia has written in a little hint here, and she said, hint, it's the one that goes from being a solid to aqueous. That's one way of doing it, okay? But I'm going to show you how to analyze this reaction here and determine which substance is being oxidized. Now, if you use her hint, you can figure out that it's the aluminum solid, okay? But let's take a look at what the charge of each one of these species is. Now, any element that's in its pure form, like I have solid aluminum, if you've ever held a piece of solid aluminum, it does not have a charge. Okay, If you pick up an aluminum baseball bat, it's not going to give you a shock. Okay, And that's because it is neutral, right? So it's got a charge of zero. Now, nitrate, NO3, we have copper, copper 2 nitrate, CuNO3 with a 2. Okay, nitrate always has a charge of minus one. And if there's two of those, it would be minus two overall. So that means that the copper must be plus two. Now let's take a look at the products. First of all, if I have solid copper, three copper solid, that has a charge of zero, right? Any element in its pure form has a charge of zero. The nitrate, that didn't change at all. It's still gonna be minus one. But what is the charge of my aluminum? Could anybody tell me what the charge of the aluminum is? You can either unmute your microphone or you could type it into the chat. I'd like to know what the charge of the aluminum is. Okay, so let's think about it. If I have, I'll write it over here in blue. If I have aluminum, if I have aluminum nitrate, right, and I have three of those nitrates, nitrate always has a charge of minus one, but I have three of them. So it's going to be minus one times three, which gives me a total of negative three. So from all of this here, you're getting a total of negative three. How would I balance out, <coughs> excuse me, how would I balance out negative three? This would have to be plus three. Yeah, exactly. So the charge on the aluminum is plus three. I should have written that in, in red to be consistent, shouldn't I? Anyhow, so we'll put here plus three. So if we take a look at what's happening, the aluminum is going from zero to plus three. How does that happen? Did aluminum lose electrons or gain electrons? In order to go from zero to plus three, did it lose or gain? Yeah, it, lo it lost electrons, exactly. So if it lost three electrons, oxidation is losing, and therefore the aluminum is the substance being oxidized, right? We'll put here alumin aluminum, okay? And just to kind of round things out, you can see that you can't have oxidation without reduction. It's like love and marriage. You can't have the two. Um, they're, they're not much mutually exclusive. So we have plus two to zero, so that means that the copper is gaining two electrons. So this is oxidation, and this one here is reduction. All right, review the gas laws. I don't have a lot of space to review them, do I? But um, you should be aware of the gas laws. First of all, you should be aware of the ideal gas law, which is PV is equal to nRT, and you can solve for all of the gas laws just by using the ideal gas law. So you should know that pressure is inversely proportional to volume, and this is Boyle's law. So Boyle's, Boyle's law, okay? So sometimes we say P1 V1 is equal to P2 V2. You should be fully cognizant of Boyle's law. The next one deals with um, volume and temperature. This is Charles' law. So you should know that V1, V1 over T1 is equal to V2 over T2. That's another one. And the last one is um, the relationship between pressure and temperature, which is P1 over T1 is equal to P2 over T2. And that's uh, Gay-Lussac's law. Anyhow, but you should be able to um, derive all of these from the ideal gas law. OK, sorry, I gotta, got to. Uh, there we go. Um, what else? Given a compound. So I'm looking at um, number 53 here. Given a compound, calculate. The osmolarity, excuse me, calculate the osmolarity of one component. So it says here, uh, what is the concentration of hydroxide 
in a 0.15 molar aluminum hydroxide solution. Um, yeah, so this one here, uh, it's cheaper, so I don't have a lot of room here to work, do I? Uh, but anyhow, I'll just try to scribble it over here. If I have aluminum, if I have aluminum hydroxide, okay, and that breaks apart into its ions, I'm going to end up with one aluminum ion, three plus, plus I'm going to end up with three hydroxide ions like that. So that means that if the concentration of aluminum hydroxide is 0.15 molar, the concentration of aluminum would be 0.15 molar when it dissociates, right? And I'm going to have three times as much hydroxide ions. So 0.15 times three, I'm going to do that in my head. It is 0 0.45 molar. That's all she's getting at in this one. So let's move on to 54. It says, given a balanced chemical equation and the mass of one of the products, determine the mass of reactant needed. So determine the mass of reactant needed. So it says here, how many grams of oxygen are required to produce 2.47 grams of carbon dioxide. Okay, well, let's take a look here. I want to make two point, oops. I want to make 2.47 grams of CO2. How would I do that? And it's asking me how much oxygen would I need? Well, the way that we could do that is to use dimensional analysis. Dimensional analysis. Pardon me. So we'll start with our 2.47 grams of carbon dioxide, right? That's where we're going to start. And we're going to have to calculate some molar masses here. Now, I've already gone ahead and done that. The molar mass of carbon dioxide is 44 grams per mole, roughly. And the molar mass of oxygen is about 32 grams per mole. Remember, it's O2 gas. Okay, so what we can do is we can convert the number of grams of carbon dioxide into the number of moles of carbon dioxide, then I can use my balanced equation to determine the number of moles of oxygen. And then once we have that, if we have the number of moles, hopefully everybody knows how to convert from moles to grams with relative ease. So let's set that up. The first thing we'll do is convert the number of grams of CO2 into moles of CO2. And for that, we will use the molar mass of carbon dioxide, which is around 44 grams, oops, 44 grams of CO2 for one mole of CO2. Now we need to determine if we were to stop here, right? If we stopped right here, all we would have is the number of moles of CO2, but we can use our balanced equation to get the conversion factor in order to determine the number of moles of oxygen. And I see that for every one mole of CO2 that's produced, I consume two moles of oxygen. And so if I stopped here, I would have the number of moles of oxygen, but again, I'm looking for the number of grams. And for that, I can use the molar mass of oxygen, which is 32 point whatever grams of O2 in one mole of O2. And I will cancel that out. And I end up with, after I punch all that spinach into my calculator, I end up with 3.59 grams of oxygen. One of the main take homes that you should get from stoichiometry in chemistry 101 is that you cannot convert from grams of, you know, one molecule to grams of another molecule or, or atom, right? We always have to go for, or proceed via moles, right? We have to go through moles. And the reason why is because different elements, different compounds have different molar masses, okay? It's like the old expression comparing apples and oranges. You can't do that. So we always have to bring everything down into molar quantities. Let's take a look at 55. It says here, given a set of pressure and volume as well as a new pressure, calculate the new volume. This would be an example of Boyle's Law. Boyle's, Boyle's Law, which we said before is this law shown up here, which is P1V1 is equal to P2. We have a sample of gas transferred from a 7.5 milliliter vessel to a 50 milliliter vessel. So we could say that our V1 is equal to 7.5 milliliters and our V2 is equal to 50 
milliliters. If the initial pressure of the gas, so our P1, is equal to 145 atmospheres and the temperature is held constant, what is the pressure of the gas sample in the 50 milliliter vessel? So that means we need to solve for P2. So you should be able to rearrange the formula that I have highlighted in yellow here in the top left of the screen and solve that for P2 and we get P2 is equal to P1 times V1 divided by V2. Make sure to put in the units of all of these given quantities to be sure that your units cancel out. So we have the 145 atmospheres. I'm not gonna convert these into liters. I'm just gonna leave them in milliliters because they're gonna cancel out anyway. And I have 7.5 milliliters and then I divide by 50 milliliters. There should only be two sig figs in my final answer. And when I punch that in my calculator, I end up with 22, 22 atmospheres. Okay, let's take a look at the next one, which deals with acids. In the acids and bases chapter, big chapter in chemistry 101, very important chapter. It says here, given a set of equilibrium constants, so that's the K equilibrium, determine which acid is the strongest. And it says, hint, look for the smaller negative exponent. Um, let's see here, which acid is the strongest? Yeah, the smaller negative exponent would be the larger number, right? Anyhow, so if I take a look at these four acids here, they all have a Ka associated with them, HA, HX, HY, and HZ. Okay, so if we think about this, we have any acid, let's call it, I don't know, I'll just stick with HA for the first one, <laughs> anyhow, and we put that in water, right? There's gonna be an equilibrium where the acid donates a proton, right? That's the definition of an acid. It donates a proton to form hydronium, and the conjugate base of the acid. And the way that we define the equilibrium constant is we say it's equal to the concentration of the products divided by the concentration of the reactants. Now we leave out water, we leave water out because it's present in such a great amount that its concentration remains relatively constant. So what does that mean? That means that, well, let's think about what acid strength is, right? The strength of an acid is based off of the amount that it dissociates, right? If the acid dissociates completely, right, that's a strong acid. If only some of the acid dissociates, right, that's a weak acid, right? So what we're quantifying here with these Ka's is how far did the dissociation go or how far to the product side does it lie? So we think about numerator, right? We have our numerator over our, over our denominator. And what she's saying here in A is that the larger the number is, the larger your Ka is, the stronger the acid is because the greater the numerator is, okay? The greater the number means a greater numerator, right? Think about it. If I have two divided by one, that equals two, right? That's greater than one over two, which is a half, okay? So that's all we're saying here, okay? Is we're just looking for the bigger numerator. So the greater the concentration of these components, the stronger the acid. So then what am I going to do? I'm going to compare all of these numbers. So I have all of these different Ka's. Which one of these is the largest Ka? Well, it's the one for HA, right? It's She said it's the one with the smaller. No, sorry, it's HX. Sorry, I highlighted the wrong one. It's HX, yes. It's the one that's times 10 to the minus 3 because that is the largest number out of those four numbers. So, oops, there we go. Largest largest Ka, therefore strongest, strongest acid. And remember that for an acid, instead of writing KEQ, we can write Ka, which just means the um, equilibrium constant for an acid is the same thing. All right, let's move on from there. And it says here, review the factors that affect the rate of reaction and how they affect that rate of reaction well, 
catalyst, how, the way that a catalyst speeds up a reaction, right, increases, increases, we'll put here reaction rate by lowering, could anybody answer or finish the sentence? What are you lowering with a catalyst? Let's see. Yeah, absolutely. So Levi, it's the activation energy. That's right. Lowering, we'll even put it in a different font here. Activation, the activation energy, exactly. Right, if we have a reaction, let's say, you know, like this, and we say this is the regular pathway, something like this, what a catalyst does is it lowers that activation energy. That's a pretty crappy version. Let's see. There you go. Lowers it so that the reaction occurs faster. Anyhow, just lowers the activation energy. Nothing more than that. Concentration. How does concentration affect the rate of a reaction? Well, if we increase increase concentration, I'll just put conch like that. We increase increase rate due to greater number of collisions, right? More molecules or atoms or ions are gonna collide and therefore we're just gonna have, you know, more reaction taking place. And then the next one deals with temperature and if we increase, increase in temperature, increases, increases kinetic energy, right? Kinetic energy of particles, um, we'll put here resulting, resulting in more effective collisions. And this was in, um, these questions were, were asked in one of the labs, I believe it was the reaction rates in equilibrium lab, lab number 11. So this is something that, you know, is near and dear to your heart already. Okay, let's move on from there. Um, and then this one is just, she just wants us to think conceptually about what it means to be an endothermic process. And I have an exothermic process written right next to it, so maybe I should delete that. But what an endothermic process is, and I will go over it here. It says an endothermic process steals energy from the surroundings. So heat goes from the surroundings into um, into the system or into the reaction. So if I, you know, if I draw a graph like this, an endothermic process would look something like this. I have, you know, my starting material, then I have my activation energy, and my my products are actually higher in energy. Right, they're higher in energy. And how did they get there? The only way that they got extra energy, right? You know the law of conservation of energy, right? And therefore they had to absorb energy from the surroundings okay so this would be an endothermic endothermic process all right um number 59 i hope i have enough room to solve this one here it says um oops i didn't mean to do that there we go given a balanced chemical equation with the amounts of both reactants determine the amount of one specific product as well as who is the limiting reactant. So this is a limiting reactant problem. So let's go over this one in juicy detail. It says, if I have this reaction, I hate it when reactions are written on two different lines. So I'll rewrite the reaction here. We have two silver nitrates plus barium chloride, and it produces barium nitrate plus silver chloride. Okay, so there's our balanced equation. It says if you take 20.7 grams of silver nitrate and if you take 28.4 grams of barium chloride, how much AgCl do you make? Okay, well, what we have to do is we have to start by saying, okay, well, let's imagine that we have 20.7 grams of silver nitrate and we have all of the barium chloride in the universe at our disposal, so 28.4 grams. I just wanted to use two different colors. 
And then whichever one of these would produce the least amount of silver chloride would be the limiting reactant. And we went over this example, you know, talking about hot dogs, <laughs> looking at buns and wieners, and I don't remember what else we did, Sundays or something, or cheese sandwiches, I don't know. But the, the rationale applies. So let's start with our silver nitrate. And if we have 20.7 grams of silver nitrate, I've already gone ahead and done a lot of the work here and looked up the formula mass of silver nitrate, which is 169.87 grams of silver nitrate in one mole of silver nitrate. Now I'm gonna use my balanced equation to figure out the molar or stoichiometric ratio of silver nitrate to silver. And you can see that for every two moles of silver nitrate that I consume, I produce one mole of silver chloride. So let's use that as our conversion factor. And already you can see that the mass of silver nitrate is canceling out. So again, we'll put down here two moles of silver nitrate consumed gives me one mole of silver chloride. Now it's asking for the mass of silver chloride. So we're gonna go ahead and convert the number of moles of silver chloride into um, grams of silver, silver chloride. I've gone ahead and looked up the formula mass of silver chloride. So one mole of sil silver chloride has 143.22 grams of silver chloride. Again, we look at all of our units cancel out. So we are left over with grams of silver chloride. And the mass that you would end up with would be 8.73 grams of silver chloride. Now we're going to do the exact same exercise for barium chloride. And if you're thinking, well, this is a lot of work. It is. It is. Okay. <laughs> there's no, and if you're wondering, is there a shortcut? No, there's no shortcut. I'm sorry. You just have to do the math for both. So let's do barium chloride next. Oops. So let's start with 28.4 grams of BaCl2. I've gone and looked up the formula weight of uh, BaCl2, which is 208.23 grams of barium chloride in a mole of barium chloride. If I was to stop right here, all I would have is the number of moles of barium chloride, but I need the number of moles of silver chloride. And you can see the ratio is one to one. So for every one mole of barium chloride, I have one mole of silver chloride. Then in one mole of silver chloride, I've already figured this out, is 143.22 grams of AgCl, silver chloride. And you can see that the moles of barium chloride cancel out, as do the moles of silver. I shouldn't say the moles of silver chloride. Anyhow, when you punch all that spinach into your calculator, you end up with a mass of silver chloride, which is, wow, a lot more than 19.5 grams of silver chloride. Which one of these is a lower number? Well, obviously, 8.73 is lower than 19.5. Therefore, the silver nitrate is the limiting reactant, right? If, if I combine these two reactants, the maximum amount of silver chloride I could produce is 8.73. Therefore, silver nitrate is the limiting reactant. Okay, that's the first one. And then we'll say that 8.73 grams of silver nitrate is formed. Boom. All right, limiting reactant problem. I haven't seen your final exam yet, the whole thing, because it's being written by Dr. Garcia. But... Um, the old ACS final that my students used to write in the face-to-face -face classroom did have a limiting reactant problem on it. So there probably will be a limiting reactant problem on your final exam. And that brings us to the last question. This is just like the real, the real exam, which I think has 60 questions. Actually, I could look that up. You can read the next question while I'm taking a peek here at something on my internet. <laughs> yeah, so I'm looking at the first version of the exam and I know she's editing it a little bit right now, but it has um, 60 questions, so 60 questions. All right, so given a process that results in energy 
being released, draw the energy diagram corresponding to the process. Now, you won't have to draw any energy diagrams, but you should be able to recognize an energy diagram. So we have energy on our y-axis, and then down here, we call this the reaction coordinate. It's just the progress of the reaction coordinate. Okay, this is basically time, okay? So if we have some starting materials, let's say we're doing a reaction, I don't know, let's say we have like A plus B gives us, you know, C plus D or something like that. We're going to start with our reactants, which is A and B, which have a certain energy. And we're talking about a process in which energy is being released. So this is going to be an exo, exothermic reaction. Okay, so we're going to have our activation energy and then our products are going to be lower in energy. So this will be our C plus D like that. And this is just an example. Okay, this is just an example. Artist rendition. Okay, there we go. And that concludes the um, horribly extensive. So this is a Dr. Garcia thing. This isn't Mr. Dion. The horribly extensive. You can see it up here. It says the horribly extensive Chem 101 final exam. I don't know if you can see it. But anyhow, I think you can. Okay, there we go. So with that in mind, I'm gonna go back to my students. Where are they? 